In this lecture, we are going to talk about chemical equilibrium, acid dissociation, and pKa. So first, before we talk about what the equilibrium constant is, let's talk about chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium is the state of a reaction where the concentrations of the reactants and the products do not change with time. That doesn't mean that there's no reaction happening. It just means that as things happen quickly, as the reaction is going back and forth, we still have the same amount of the starting materials as we do in the products. Reactions don't start at equilibrium. You're going to start with different concentrations of things. They're going to react until they find an equilibrium. And at the point of the equilibrium, you can think of things coming in and coming out, but we've got the same concentration. One way to think of this might be like a sports game, how you have players that can substitute in and substitute out but we still have the same number of players on the field. They're just changing. So what is the equilibrium constant? That's what we use to measure the extent to which the reactants are converted to the products. We use KEQ to represent the equilibrium constant. And this is gonna tell us how much product we have versus how much starting materials we have. To get an equilibrium constant, we need to look at a generic reaction, and one is shown here. And you notice the equilibrium constant is related to the concentrations of the products. Our products are over here. Right? And the products in our equation are on the top. The concentrations of the products at equilibrium are what we're looking at. Now remember that when we're looking what equilibrium means is that's when, they're, when it isn't changing anymore. So your reaction might have had some sort of initial concentration, but once it gets to equilibrium, those are the concentrations that we're talking about. And our reactants over here are on the bottom. Okay, so this is how you would get to the KEQ expression or the equilibrium constant. Let's look at some specific examples for what we're learning. So for a proton transfer reaction, you have an acid and you have a base. And if we were to write out the equilibrium expression for this one, remember that it's the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So our equilibrium expression for this particular reaction would be A minus, there's the concentration of A minus, times the concentration of HB, there's the concentration of HB, over the concentration of HA, our acid, and the concentration of B minus, our base. So you can see that what happens is if we have a very large KEQ, that implies that the products are favored because the products are on the top. And so if those concentrations are big, that's going to give you a big KEQ value. If you have a small KEQ, that means that your reactants are favored. And hopefully that makes sense because if these concentrations are very big, that means that KEQ is going to become very, very small. If KEQ is close to one, this means that you have similar amounts of reactants and products or large amounts of both reactants and products because that means that your concentrations of your products and your reactants would be approximately equal. Now let's talk about what Ka is. Ka is the acid dissociation constant. So it measures the strength of an acid in an aqueous solution. Very specifically, it's going to tell us something about how strong our acid is. So if we know what the Ka is, we can determine if something is a stronger or a weaker acid. Now, if we talk about an acid-base reaction, remember that we said Ka, we're going to talk about the strength of an acid in an aqueous solution. So our base is going to be water and we can use any generic acid, so we're still gonna use HA 
like we did in the previous example, we're just replacing B minus with water. That means that when water reacts with HA or acid, we get H3O plus or hydronium. And then we're also going to get A minus. So we have our acid over here, our base, and then we are going to form our conjugate acid. and conjugate base. Here's our equilibrium expression for this reaction. Notice that the concentration of H3O plus and A minus, the products are on the top and the reactants HA and water are on the bottom. So this is our KEQ for an acid base reaction in water or in aqueous solution. Ka is defined as Keq times water. So what does that mean? That means that Ka is equal to the concentration of H3O plus times A minus over the concentration of HA. So this is what we're going to use to measure the strength of our acid solution. Now, if you have lots of products, that means you had to have a strong acid to get there. And if you have lots of starting material, right, HA, that means that your acid's pretty weak and it didn't do much in terms of forming products. Okay, so now we have our equation for Ka. We know that Ka is equal to Keq times water. And we now know that if we have large Ka's, we're going to have stronger acids. And if we have smaller Ka's, we're going to have weaker acids. Well, usually we don't actually look at Ka values directly. We like to look at the negative log of the Ka values or the pKa. And if you know something about math, then you know that this is going to kind of flip things. That means that if we have large pKa's, they are going to be corresponding with weaker acids. So small pKa's mean that we have very, very strong acids. And usually what we're going to be looking at is the pKa value. Here are some examples of Ka and pKa values from your textbook. So remember that we said that big Ka values are associated with strong acids but also small pKa values are associated with strong acids. So let's look at one you probably know. Here's sulfuric acid. And this table has a picture of the acid, the conjugate base, and the Ka value, which is pretty big, one times 10 to the nine. Also look at the pKa at negative nine. Both of those values are telling us that we have um, a very strong acid. The pKa values are a little bit nicer to work with, so you'll usually see a lot of pKa values listed and referred to rather than Ka values. Let's look at another one. So hydrochloric acid is something that you should also recognize as being a strong acid. It also has a big Ka, 1 times 10 to the 7, and a small pKa at negative 7. So this is a strong acid. All right, let's look at the other side of the table. And let's check out water, for example. Water is something that you consider not to be a very strong acid, right? It has a Ka value of 2 times 10 to the negative 16, which means that it has a pKa of 15.7. So 15.7 is something that really isn't that acidic. And we can kind of use that as a good estimate. So things below 15.7 are going to be more acidic than water. And things above a pKa of 15.7 are going to be more basic than water. There are all sorts of other cool values that you can check out here on this pKa table. Let's flip to the next part of it. I wanted to show you some examples of bases. So on this part of the table, you can see that now we have aniline, which is considered to be a base. It has a very small 
aka value, 1 times 10 to the negative 27. That's extremely small, which gives us a pKa of 27. Notice that this pKa value is higher than water and much, much higher than the acids that we were looking at before. So this is a good example of a base. Now let's look at methane, which is another hydrogen that's going to be hard to take off. You can see that this has a really huge Ka, 1 times 10 to the negative 48. That means it has a pKa of 48. And this is something that's going to be not acidic at all. Now, there's all sorts of pKa values and all sorts of tables. There are pages and pages of pKa value tables. These are a few good ones to know, and it'll be very helpful to you if you just commit these to memory. So hydronium, which is H3O+, and you can see that if it has an R group here, so for example, something like this, right, or we can have hydronium. These types of compounds, which have a positive charge on that oxygen, either a protonated alcohol or a protonated water, are going to have very low pKa values. You don't have to know exactly what they are, but if you remember that they're less than zero, that's going to help you out immensely. Carboxylic acids, on the other hand, they are a little bit higher pKa value. They're still considered to be acids, but they're not as strong. They're not in the negative pKa value range, and they're usually around 4, 5, or 6. Protonated amines, shown here, are going to usually have pKa values of around 10. And remember that R group can be basically anything. So you'll see protonated amines. They're attached to carbons. You might also see NH4 plus ammonium. And they're usually going to have pKa values in that range. Alcohols, and I'll draw an example here, will have pKa's approximately 16. Remember that water is right in that range, and so water will have a similar pK. If you know these, that'll really help you out in terms of moving forward. So I recommend, strongly recommend you commit them to memory. At this point, pause the video and try clicker question 2, 3, and 4. Now let's use what we learned about pKa values to predict the outcome of a proton transfer reaction. What we want to be able to do is, given any type of proton transfer reaction, predict whether the reactants, the starting materials, are favored, or if the products are favored. To solve these types of problems, we're just going to walk through a couple steps. So first, we identify the acid on each side of the reaction. On the left side, we're going to compare the carboxylic acid and NH3, ammonia, and the carboxylic acid would be our acid. And if you're trying to figure out why that's the case, notice that NH3 picked up a hydrogen in that carboxylic acid there. On the right side, now which one's the acid? NH4 plus, the ammonium. So we did that. Next, we want to use the pKa values of the two acids to figure out which one's weaker and which one's stronger. So I've written the pKa values here, and these are ones that on that list where I said it would be useful to commit to memory. If you did that, you didn't necessarily have to look up the pKa of this acid. You could just look at it and say, okay, well, it's a carboxylic acid, so it probably has a pKa of about 5. And then on the right side of the equation, Again, you didn't have to look up the specific pKa value, but if you remember that a protonated amine is going to have a pKa value of about 10. So now we've gotten our pKa values, and you'll notice that the weaker acid is the one with a higher pKa value, so NH4 plus is our weaker acid. Our stronger acid is our carboxylic acid with a pKa of 5. Remember that lower pKa's correspond to stronger acids. So the last thing we need to do is identify the weaker acid, which we just did. And the equilibrium always favors the weaker acid. That means that the equilibrium is going to favor our products, or our weaker base and our weaker acid.
Now let's talk about the leveling effect. One of the problems is if you have a really strong acid and you put it in solution, you are limited by the basicity of whatever solvent you're using. Same thing with bases. If you have a very strong base, the strength of your base is limited by the acidity of what's whatever solvent you're using. In a lot of cases, this is water, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Let's look at these two examples. So in our first one, we're talking about adding HCl to water. Now, HCl has a pKa of negative 7. If you use that table that I showed you just a couple of slides back. But if you have HCl and water, you're not going to get a solution with a pKa of negative 7. What happens is the HCl, as shown, is going to react with water. And you're going to end up instead with hydronium, or H3O+, which has a pKa of negative 1.7. So even though we added HCl, which has a lower pK and is more acidic, we're not going to be able to get something that acidic because it's going to react and form hydronium. Bottom example, we have a base. So you can see here we have a very strong base. This is a negative charge on a nitrogen. And if you mix it with water, you're not going to get this as a base. It's going to quickly react with water and form an amine. So you'll have the same problem. If you have a base, it could potentially react with the water. You also probably want to familiarize yourself with the Chatelier's principle. You've probably heard of the Chatelier's principle. And the Chatelier's principle tells us that if a reaction at equilibrium experiences a change in a reaction conditions, and that can be anything like concentration, temperature, pressure, volume, then the equilibrium will shift to counteract that change. So let's look at how that would apply here. Notice that we have HCl. We identified that as a strong acid that reacts with water to form hydronium and Cl-. Well, if you were to add something to the reaction, let's say Cl-, that means that the reaction equilibrium would shift back towards the reactants. And the same thing would happen if you added some more hydronium. And that's what we want to think about in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. So we increase the concentration of something like H3O plus or hydronium would cause the equilibrium to shift a little bit towards the reactants. That concludes this video. Try clicker questions 5, 6, and 7, and then move on to the next video.